Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Professionally Speaking, the Reaction Against Ethnophilosophy. Imagine for a second that you knew nothing at all about philosophy. I know it's not easy, but just do your best. Now imagine that in this ignorant state, you happen to have the opportunity to visit Harvard or Oxford or some other famous university. Walking the halls and finding yourself by chance in the philosophy department, you boldly knock on the door of one of the professors, and to your delight, she kindly invites you to enter and sit down. As you take your seat, you explain that you would very much like to know what philosophy is. Not being familiar with the ways of philosophers, you are slightly taken aback by her initial reply that the question of what philosophy is is itself a difficult philosophical question. You try, therefore, to ask what you assume must be an easier question as your eye turns to the shelves lining the office, jam-packed with books. You ask, what would you recommend that I study if I want to learn about what the greatest philosophers in the West have had to say? The professor sits back in her chair, thinks for a while, and finally answers, I think one of the best bits has to be the one about how if a black cat crosses your path, that's bad luck. Also, if you break a mirror, probably one of those two. Clearly, this story went off the rails at the end. It's not merely unlikely, but well-nigh impossible that a philosophy professor would offer up common superstitions as any part of Western philosophy, never mind the best part. Our tale seeks to dramatize a point that Quasi Wiridu makes in a classic essay of his first published in 1976 called How Not to Compare African Traditional Thought with Western Thought. Wiridu complains about the fact that belief in various gods and spirits and practices like witchcraft are unfairly seen as characteristic of African thought. After all, beliefs of this kind are common among Westerners as well. As the title of his essay suggests, he implores us to treat traditional African beliefs, which he takes to be most often held superstitiously rather than on the basis of rational support, as comparable with traditional unscientific beliefs common in the West, also generally based on superstition. What does this mean for the study of philosophy? According to Wiridu, the least that African philosophers and foreign well-wishers can do in this connection is to refrain in this day and age from serving up the usual conjuries of unargued conceptions about gods, ghosts, and witches in the name of African philosophy. In other words, if you would refer the person who knows nothing about Western philosophy to Plato or Descartes, and not to beliefs about black cats and broken mirrors bringing bad luck, then why not extend the same courtesy to Africans when talking about African philosophy? Because of this essay and others he wrote in the 1970s, Wiridu is often classified as a representative of what eventually became known as the professional school in African philosophy. The professional school, whether understood as a set of thinkers or as a distinctive approach to doing African philosophy, is especially distinguished by the way it emerged as a reaction against another school or current within African philosophy, namely ethno-philosophy. Let us return then to the story of breakthrough moments in African philosophy in the 20th century, which we began telling in episode 15, in order to see how the professional school came to be and why. As we discussed in that episode, the book Bantu Philosophy by the Belgian missionary Placide Templos sparked a great deal of interest. For some Africans, it served as an inspiring precedent, encouraging them to look for a philosophy in the traditions of their own indigenous cultures. Thus, in 1956, a little over a decade after the publication of Bantu philosophy in 1945, the Rwandan philosopher Alexis Kagame completed his important book, written in French, The Rwandan Bantu Philosophy of Being. This pioneering work was followed in the rest of the 1950s and during the 1960s, by a number of other contributions. These two were written in French, notably similar in orientation, and very often by thinkers who were, like Temples and Kagame before them, also Catholic clergymen. In English-speaking Africa, two of the major texts on African philosophy that appeared in the 1960s were 
The Mind of Africa, a 1962 book by the Ghanaian philosopher William Abraham, and in 1967, a book we have mentioned a number of times, African Religions and Philosophy, by John Mbiti of Kenya, who for once was not a Catholic priest. He was an Anglican one. Like a martini about to be served to James Bond, though, this situation was ready to be shaken up. A challenge against the ethno-philosophical approach was launched by another figure we mentioned back in episode 15, a philosopher from Benin named Paulin Utonji. Starting in the late 1960s, he produced numerous lectures and articles on the nature of African philosophy, culminating in a 1976 book written in French whose title in English translation is African Philosophy, Myth, and Reality. In this book, Utonji called for nothing less than a complete rethinking of what African philosophy is, and a complete reorganization and reorientation of ongoing efforts aimed at developing African philosophy as an academic field of research. The book begins with a now notorious definition of terms, a definition that is intentionally simple in form, yet quite striking in its implications. Hutonji writes, By African philosophy, I mean a set of texts, specifically the set of texts written by Africans and described as philosophical by their authors themselves. At first glance, this definition may sound open-minded, perhaps even excessively broad. What counts as African philosophy? Well, if you are African, you wrote something, and you would describe it as philosophical, then congratulations, it counts. On the other hand, there is a way in which the definition could seem excessively narrow. We've spent considerable time looking at the idea that philosophy can be located in oral traditions. This definition, though, stipulates that African philosophy can consist only of written texts. So what then is this definition doing for Hudonji? A number of things, really, so we will keep count of them as we go. First, he identifies a body of literature that is waiting to be read and critically evaluated and that can legitimately be called African philosophy. As radical a rethinking as he is attempting, he does not begin with a question like, does African philosophy exist? Much less, is it possible for there to be such a thing as African philosophy? He points out that instead of asking such questions, we can at least acknowledge that there are texts we can read by African authors that are portrayed by these authors themselves as being somehow philosophical in nature. We can examine such texts and ask whether African philosophy is doing well or whether it has been afflicted in its existence thus far by systematic problems that need diagnosing and fixing. A second thing Hutonji's definition does is to exclude Tembles's Bantu philosophy from its scope, because it was not written by an African. This might come as a surprise, given that Bantu philosophy has often been treated as something like the birth of African philosophy as a distinct genre of writing. Hutonji, however, treats the book as a mere forerunner or precursor to African philosophy, which is embodied in texts written by Africans. Bantu philosophy is therefore revealed to be important for its influence rather than in and of itself. If we need to discuss this Belgian missionary's work in the context of studying African philosophy, it will be only insofar as it has had an impact on African authors. Donji's evaluation of Bantu philosophy is something we began covering in episode 15. It was in relation to Bantu philosophy that he first introduced the term ethno-philosophy as a way of criticizing Temples's study as an ethnological work with philosophical pretensions. He also emphasized that Temples's book is explicitly addressed not to Africans, but to fellow Europeans, especially those involved in the colonization of Africa, whose people were thus objects of study and not participants in a conversation. Another intended virtue of Hutonji's definition is that by excluding works like Bantu philosophy, it treats African philosophy as being necessarily a matter of Africans taking up the role of subjects who speak, or rather, subjects who write. As Hutonji shows, there are a number of levels at which we might criticize Temples' book. There is, as we have seen, the problem of its intended audience. Then there is a problem of what it says to that audience. Utonji points out the biting criticism of Bantu philosophy that we get in Aimé Césaire's classic work, Discourse on Colonialism, published in 1950. Césaire was an important poet, politician, and philosophical thinker from Martinique, whom we will discuss in detail in future episodes. As Utonji explains, 
Césaire criticized Bantu philosophy for attempting to create a kind of diversion from the problem of colonial exploitation. Césaire suggested that the message of temples in this conversation among Europeans was this. You needn't worry so much about Bantus protesting for things like better wages or decent food and housing if you simply show a little respect for their souls by acknowledging their idea of being as vital force. While certainly appreciative of how, well, vitally forceful this criticism was, Utonji nevertheless argues that it leaves the deepest problem with Temples' work untouched. Césaire explicitly denied that the target of his criticism was Bantu thought, clarifying that he was attacking only the political use made of this form of thought by Temples. But in Hutonji's eyes, the problem was the very idea of Bantu thought promoted by Temples. What needs to be attacked and overcome, according to him, is the idea that there might exist a hidden philosophy to which all Bantus unconsciously and collectively adhered. This is the crux of the matter, not just for Hutonji, but for all who are classified as part of the professional school. For them, Temples' work and the subsequent work of African thinkers who likewise sought to elaborate the philosophy implicit within traditional African culture promoted a false idea of what philosophy is. African philosophy cannot be the implicit ideas of a collectivity, according to the members of this school. It can only exist in the form of ideas and arguments worked out by individual African thinkers. Let us continue with Otonji for the moment to see some of the ways he drives this point home. One of his key moves is to note that, while Kagame is inspired by temples and agrees with him about a number of things, there are significant disagreements between them as well. Most significantly, Utonji points out that Kagame in fact rejects the fundamental thesis of the Belgian missionary, according to which the equivalence of the concepts of being and power is the essential characteristic of Bantu thought. In other words, whereas Temples claims that being and force are indistinguishable in Bantu thought so that they have a conception of being as dynamic in comparison to the Western conception of being as static, Kagame argues that all things are alternately static or dynamic according to how you look at them, and this is the case in both Bantu and Western thought. The disagreement here is in fact a subtle one, which is perfect given Hontonji's reason for bringing it up. He asks, who is right? Which is the better interpretation? Under normal circumstances, when considering conflicting interpretations of a philosophical perspective, the next step is to return to the source. For example, if considering two conflicting interpretations of Confucius, the best way to figure out which interpretation you prefer is to grab your copy of the Analects off your shelf. In the case of Kagame's disagreement with temples, however, Hutonji says that there can be no resolution because there are no sources. There is no book you can consult to check whether you think temples or Kagame is closer to the mark. One might object that even if there is not a written text to consult, it nevertheless remains the case that we can interpret oral literature, proverbs, tales, dynastic poems, and so on. Huntonji's reply is that this involves a confusion of categories, the arbitrary projection of the status of philosophical discourse onto products of language evidently not intended as philosophy. This can help us recognize a few more things that Huntonji is doing with his definition of African philosophy. The third thing, by our count, is that his definition implies a more general claim to the effect that philosophical traditions must be tied to traditions of writing. We've already acknowledged that this is a controversial implication of his view. How can he defend this? After all, Socrates never wrote anything, yet is recognized as among the greatest philosophers. Hutonji does not find the objection to be a telling one. Certainly, one might say something philosophically interesting without writing it down, but it is only through writing that it can become a part of a theoretical tradition that can orient future discussion. Thus, according to him, thousands of Socrateses could never have given birth to Greek philosophy. It is only because fellow citizens and disciples wrote down his thoughts that the historical Socrates could attain his stature in the history of philosophy. A fourth thing we can count is the way that Huntonji's definition purposefully contrasts the genuinely philosophical nature of written texts described as philosophy by their authors, such as Kagame's Rwandan Bantu philosophy of being, or MBT's African religions and philosophy, with the oral traditions onto which these very same authors imaginatively project the status of philosophy. For Huntonji, 
Bantu philosophy and all other philosophies ascribed to groups of Africans are nothing but myths. He encourages us to let go of what he calls the myth of primitive unanimity, or more famously, the dogma of unanimism. This is, for him, not merely a rejection of the idea that groups can think, but also a call for a renewal of intellectual responsibility. You can decide whether you find this charitable or insulting on his part, but Hun Tongji charges African ethno-philosophers with having misunderstood, of all things, themselves. Even as they were producing the literature that has made up African philosophy as we have it, they have apparently taken themselves to be not producing, but simply recounting that which existed before them. Hun Tongji condemns this as self-denial, and encourages the ethno-philosopher to recognize and accept that it is he or she who is making theoretical choices, even while disguising these choices with the myth of collective philosophy. So what does Untonji want in place of ethno-philosophy? Here we come to a fifth and final thing Untonji's definition is meant to accomplish. By providing a merely geographical criterion for African philosophy, rather than a definition based on subject matter, it is intended to pave the way toward a truly free and mature philosophical conversation among Africans, in place of ethno-philosophy's self-effacing presentation of myths as philosophy. Ethno-philosophy has been a waste of time, he claims, a useless attempt to codify a supposedly given, ready-constituted thought instead of wading in, throwing ourselves into the fray, and thinking new thoughts on the basis of today's and tomorrow's problems. By today's and tomorrow's problems, he means whatever might be a problem worthy of philosophical attention. The first task of African philosophers today, he tells us, is to promote and sustain constant free discussion about all the problems concerning their discipline. Influenced by his reading of the German philosopher Edmund Husserl and by his teacher, the French philosopher Louis Althusser, Utonji associates the development of a free and mature philosophical discussion with the development of an appropriately scientific perspective. In fact, he goes so far as to claim that it is not philosophy but science that Africa needs first. This provides us with the occasion to bring back in other voices, or rather writings, usually grouped under the heading of the professional school. A common theme in the group is a high value placed upon scientific thought. In his 1980 book, Philosophy and an African Culture, which includes the aforementioned How Not to Compare African Traditional Thought with Western thought, and other essays written mainly during the 1970s, Kwasi Wiritu repeatedly emphasizes the importance of science in the transition from traditional to modern life in general, and in particular, in the development of African philosophy as a matter of individual responsibility, rather than the mere collection of folk traditions. Another philosopher who has emphasized the importance of science is Masien Toa, a Cameroonian philosopher. If Hun Tongji had already been using ethno-philosophy as a term of criticism in the late 1960s, it is nevertheless the case that the first critique of the practice to appear in book form was Toa's 1971 Essay on the Problem of Philosophy in Contemporary Africa, again written in French. Here he accuses ethno-philosophy of wrongfully expanding the concept of philosophy until it becomes coextensive with that of culture, whereas properly understood, the doing of philosophy does not start until the decision to subject a philosophical and cultural heritage to uncompromising critique. Towa argues that ethno-philosophy is doubly a failure, as it is insufficiently neutral to count as good ethnology, and insufficiently critical to count as good philosophy. Most strikingly, he argues that whereas ethno-philosophy involves investment in the cult of difference and originality, Preserving difference is the last thing Africans should be doing if they wish to overcome the legacy of colonial defeat. After all, Towa reasons, the secret to the West's victory over Africa must have something to do with the difference between the two. What is necessary for the empowerment of Africa, then, is understanding the competitive advantage of the West and putting its power to African use. That secret, according to Towa, is science and philosophy, and not philosophy in the overly expansive sense used by ethno-philosophers, but in the most rigorous and fundamentally modern sense, according to which it is deeply intertwined and in some ways even interchangeable with the concept of science. This is the kind of philosophy that Africa needs, according to Towa. Another name for the professional school is the Universalists, 
Philosophers like Utunji, Wiridu, and Towa argued that the word philosophy, in the term African philosophy, must not mean something unique and particular to Africa, it must mean the same thing that it does in the term Western philosophy, and must therefore be recognized as a term of universal significance rather than something that is fundamentally different from place to place. Many listeners might find this ideal of philosophy as a universal practice inspiring and attractive. Others might be struck and perhaps even repelled by how universalism, as it is upheld by the professional school, can often seem to be not so much an escape from cultural difference as a complete surrender to the cultural dominance of Europe and its notions of philosophy, science, and modernity. Samuel Imbo sums up this concern when he suggests that, while figures associated with ethnophilosophy may be too invested in affirming African difference, figures like Untunji offer us instead a universality that is equally problematic because of its uncritical bowing at the feet of Europe. It may seem like a stretch to call Huntunji uncritical about anything. We're talking about someone who takes inspiration from the critical philosophy of Immanuel Kant. But then again, the fact that he aims to take after the German Kant would be part of Imbo's point. Role models aside, we might at least admit that there is something discomforting in the way he and other members of the philosophical school treat philosophy as so foundationally and comfortably European and so newly and insecurely African. Kwame Jeche exposes this problem well in his essay on African philosophical thought. He points out that Wiridu and another English-speaking member of the professional school, Peter Bodunrin, speak of African philosophy as in the making. At one point, Untonji too, despite his recognition of African ethno-philosophers as having created a philosophical literature, points African philosophy in the direction he wants it to go by saying that our philosophy is yet to come. Cheche appears to catch these critics of ethnophilosophy in an inconsistency, though, for each of them seems to allow that philosophical thinking could not have been completely absent in traditional Africa. Ntonji, for example, when arguing that African philosophy is before us, not behind us, and must be created today by decisive action, nevertheless reassures us that this will not be creation out of nothing, and so it will necessarily embrace the heritage of the past and will therefore be a recreation. Jeche rightfully asks us to wonder how African philosophy in the present can be a recreation of the heritage of the past if it is not the case that philosophy was part of traditional African culture. On this basis, Jeche strongly rejects the tendency of the professional school to steer African philosophy away from the task of locating philosophical material within oral traditions. Whatever one's stance may be on the professional school and its fierce attack on ethnophilosophy, there can be no doubt that they did shake things up, turning African philosophy into an exciting matter of debate and making it a source of profound metaphilosophical reflections. Also, if it is easy enough to raise the worry that the professional school was too unwilling to challenge European cultural values and conceptions of philosophical practice, it would be unfair to suggest that this is because it was so universalistic in its outlook that it simply neglected the affirmation of African independence. To the contrary, even when Towa goes so far as to suggest that Africans should avoid preserving difference and instead seek to attain the secret of the West, his explicit motivation is the achievement of power that will secure African independence, end neocolonialism, and prevent Africa from being vulnerable to colonial exploitation in the future. In this way, he argues, we are led to adopt an attitude of openness in relation to European civilization precisely in order to free ourselves from European domination. Utonji's critique of ethnophilosophy has a significant political dimension as well, even though he has argued that one difference between his and Toa's views is that Toa puts philosophy more completely in the service of politics than he does. Remember that one problem with Temples and his influence over African philosophy is that he was a European in conversation with other Europeans. Untunji's firm conviction is that African ethnophilosophy follows Temples even in this aspect. As he puts it, the quest for originality is always bound up with a desire to show off. In other words, the ethnophilosophical quest to show how different philosophy is from an African perspective is motivated by a desire to be recognized as special from a European perspective. Thus, he argues that contemporary African philosophy 
in as much as it remains an ethno-philosophy, has been built up essentially for a European public. True independence for Africa therefore requires putting an end to this scandalous extraversion. He demands that, when Africans do philosophy, they address it first and foremost to their fellow countrymen and offer it for the appreciation and discussion of Africans themselves. We have thus reached a critically important moment in our story of African philosophy. Some listeners may find themselves torn, having been exposed on the one hand to the philosophical interest of examining African oral traditions, but perhaps also feeling the force of the arguments put by the professional school. Faced with this battle between two approaches, you might hope for some kind of peaceful reconciliation that could preserve the insights of both camps. If so, you'll be glad to hear that this is, arguably, what eventually happened. We will soon explore how figures like Untonji and especially Wiridu change the direction of their research in a way that can be taken to signify rapprochement with their old ethno-philosophical foes. Before that, however, there is a different sort of compromised position between ethno-philosophy and the professional school's critique of it that we need to explore. Funnily enough, this compromise was brought to us by the very philosopher who first came up with the professional school as a label. We are speaking of Henry Odera Oruka, a Kenyan philosopher who distinguished between four trends or approaches in African philosophy. First, there was ethno-philosophy. Second, the response to it, professional philosophy. A third was the nationalist ideological approach in which he included the political theories of the first leaders of independent African countries, thinkers whose works we will be discussing in episodes to come. Then, despite the fact that Oruka identified himself as part of the professional school and first made a name for himself with an article clearly written from that approach, entitled Mythologies as African Philosophy, he included as the fourth approach something that he himself pioneered, the study of philosophical sagacity. If ethno-philosophy rightly showed the importance of looking for philosophy in traditional African settings, and if the professional school rightly showed the need for looking to individuals rather than to groups for critical philosophical thought, then Oruka's innovation, commonly known as sage philosophy, strove to bridge the gap by interviewing individuals who were still living relatively traditional lives in rural communities and who were recognized as wise within their communities. It would be a sage decision on your part, dear listener, to join us for that next time here on the History of Africana Philosophy. (laughs) 